Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 NAFEX Fruit Exploring Growing Forward Conference. Tonight is our keynote speaker, and this is the last session of our conference. I want to welcome you all this evening to this. It's been a fabulous week. We've had so many great speakers, so much great, great content, and more to come tonight. So my name is Chris Heater. I am the facilitator tonight, but I'm also the NAFEX president. Um, NAFEX is organized by a number of volunteers. And before we get started, I want to give you a few housekeeping things for those of you who might be here on your very first uh, Zoom webinar with us this week. We've had a lot of people join us today. This is a Zoom webinar. It's not like a Zoom meeting that many of you have attended. So you are automatically muted and your video is off um, and it will stay off and muted the whole time. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, we do encourage questions. Um, so if you think of things while Michael is speaking tonight, uh, if you take your little cursor and go down toward the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a panel pop up, hit the Q&A and you could ask questions there, or if you have technical problems, you could type those in as well. We have somebody moderating that area of um, the webinar, so we'll keep track of that. You have control of everything else, so um, you can kind of uh, cater your screen to whatever works best for you. And then just a reminder that this is being recorded as have all the other sessions um, this week. And those are being made available on the website within 24 hours after each session. Um, and you'll just log into the website with your email address and you'll be able to access those. They'll live there for the next year. So you can access them 24 seven. You can go back and rewatch something if you um, missed something or if you wanna re-listen to something again. And then we'll eventually move those over to YouTube after a year. So before we go into the keynote, I just wanna give a little bit of background about NAFEX. I know many of you have heard this all week long, but we do have new people on tonight. So NAFEX has been around for over 50 years. It was started in 1967, but there was actually some grassroots effort, efforts to organize something prior to that. But it has been around that long. Um, it was uh, started by two men who felt like there was a need for growers and amateur fruit explorers to come together and share information. And again, this was back in the day before there was computers. So um, there was there was this this effort to really start communicating within North America and sharing ideas and learning from each other. NAFEX has been printing a quarterly newsletter slash magazine for the last 50 plus years. And that is available to all members four times a year. And as members, you have access to all back issues of those. And we have a searchable archive, which is really cool. So um, if you haven't explored that yet, I highly encourage you to do so. We did a little tutorial on Thursday night during our show and tell. So you could go back and watch that if you need to. And then we have interest groups and we have a regional help online. Um, and this year we explored interest group meetups via Zoom. And I think we're gonna probably do that a little bit more next year. And we'll talk about that in the months to come. So I think I've given you all the background that you need. You can see all of this at nafex.org. And with that, I'm gonna introduce our keynote speaker tonight. Um, and just a little side note, I met Michael and heard him speak at the Purdue Small Farm Conference a couple of years ago and was just blown away by the work that he's done. It's just so much out there. And as a biologist, I really appreciate all the, the work that he has done and everything that he shares. And he, and he shares it for people of all levels, new growers, as well as those who are more advanced. So I hope that you'll enjoy his talk tonight. He's renowned for helping people grow healthy fruit using herbal protocols. The community orchard movement that he helped found at grower, groworganicapples.com provides a full immersion into the holistic approach to orcharding. His Lost Nation Orchard is part of a medicinal herb farm in Northern New Hampshire. Michael is the author of the books, The Apple Grower and The Holistic Orchard, which received Garden Book of the Year honors from the American Horticultural Society. His work has been compared with Sir Albert Howard and Rodell's classic books on organic gardening. He teamed up with his wife, Nancy, to write The Herbalist Way to explore the many paths whereby herbalists find their green niche. Michael's latest book, The Mycorrhizal Planet, How Fungi 
and plants work together to create dynamic soils will definitely rock you. So if you haven't seen any of those books yet, or maybe not all of them, definitely check them out. You will not be disappointed. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael. Michael, you can take it away. Thank you, Chris. It's really nice to be here tonight with everybody. It's, you know, you're my family. We're all tree people. And when we talk about fruit trees and orchards, it's just, it's our passion and our and our hearts putting them right out there you know and on my path um back in the 1980s i connected with nafex and i was reading pomona the hard copy and talking to people like hector black and ed fackler and doreen howard and donna in tennessee and and so many others bill mckentley and and that was part of my learning path it's like talking to these great people about varieties and ideas and and, and formulating how do we grow these things how do we grow fruit in a healthy way and and tonight what i want to do is is give you an overview of what i call the holistic orchard the holistic approach um but basically what we're doing is is we're addressing that question how does nature do health how how are trees healthy how is soil healthy and what is our role as human beings to make all those sorts of things happen so let me call up the screen here and that should be good. So we're going to explore what I call the five tenets of, of holistic orcharding. And it's just really five areas that interweave, overlap. And as we do that, Hopefully it'll it'll spark something for you that you'll realize I need to look into that a little bit more. That's something I need to add to my own orcharding efforts. Uh, but as well, I'll also call in a, a, a bring up a few examples of specific challenges and how the holistic method approach deals with that. So hopefully it'll get our heads around many of these different ideas. And at the very end, we'll have some questions and answers and and that'll launch us into some great discussion. So for me, on my path, you know, my goal was, and, and, and this was a very virgin goal, <laughs> I wanna grow organically, I, I don't wanna go to the chemical route, but I didn't really know enough to do it well. And it took many years to figure things out. And one of the breakthrough moments was this realization that if I'm going to support system health, which is basically the definition of holistic, um, that's not quite the same as reaching for spray remedies, whether they're chemical or organic, to deal with challenges. I, I need to really make the ecosystem healthy, make the soil healthy, make the trees healthy. This picture comes from the 1930s, and you see two guys up there and they have the trident wands. They're spraying lead arsenic, um, about as allopathic as you can get, you know, direct toxicity to deal with a certain insect challenge. Nobody is wearing any kind of safety gear. The horses don't have masks. Um, and that was really kind of that pivotal point. It's like either I'm doing things in an allopathic approach to address symptoms, or I am doing something in a deeper way. So I'm working with the trees, with the soil, with all of nature to grow that fruit that I want to produced from my family, from my community. So we're going to go into these five tenants. Basically, just a quick overview. We're going to be talking about fungal stewardship, both the fungi in the soil, fungi above, um, mineralization, give you some understanding of why we really need to have availability of trace minerals in this picture, uh, how all that ties into tree phytochemistry, the tree's ability to resist disease and insects ties to its doing photosynthesis as well and having lots of energy in order to produce the phytochemicals that are going to be able to change that picture. Um, competitive colonization is a really cool area. It's, it's how I basically deal with fire blight and a number of diseases. And, and finally, rolling in outrageous diversity that the more, the larger the plant community is, the more connections we're going to have into place. So let's start off with fungal stewardship. 
So one of the things I talk about in my book is I address the question, where does an apple tree want to grow? Where does a fruit tree want to grow? And the answer is not Georgia or Northern California or Northern New Hampshire for that matter, but, but it's really about the soil ecology. And it has to do with the, the balance of bacteria and fungal biomass in that soil. And the ideal spot is on the edge of the forest. And what we need to do as growers is bring that edge of the forest soil ecology into where we are actually growing our fruit trees. So this picture is my, my daughter, Gracie, standing behind our BCS brush mower. Um, this is really not like a picture of the edge of the forest, but it's, it's gonna be an example of, of how I go about doing forest edge ecology in my orchard. Uh, and I'll be talking about that a little bit more. So out there in the soil, we have the soil food web. All of you are familiar with that. Uh, the acidomycetes and the sapotrophic fungi and the bacteria, the mycorrhizal fungi that have a direct relationship with the roots of plants, um, the protozoa, the nematodes that consume those smaller microbes, thus releasing nutrients. Um, very complex, very beautiful, uh, very overwhelming to contemplate. Kind of arrogant, but one of the things I think of myself as the captain of this team, uh, this incredible team, the Soil Food Web. But I, I know that I have one job, and my job is not to screw up my team. And that, that's incredibly freeing, because once you start to recognize your job is to help facilitate all these connections, but not screw them up. That's a pivotal point um, because the soil food web, all these microbes do many, many amazing things. So when I refer to that fungal bacterial biomass, uh, at the edge of the forest, it turns out that the fungal biomass is about 10 times greater than the bacterial biomass. Both are important. Uh, it's just, we're not talking about an old growth forest setting where the fungal biomass is gonna be 100 times greater. We're not talking about a organic garden setting where it's gonna be more in equilibrium one-to-one. -one. We're really going for a little bit more of a fungal dominant system. And, and there are ways that we go about that. So in introducing mycorrhizal fungi, which is such an important concept, uh, I like to look at this picture. And this picture shows the nutrient transfer mechanism known as an arbuscule of endomycorrhizae fungi, which is actually penetrating into the cell of the root of plants. And if you look at the arbuscule, you know, I, I might say that looks a lot like a tree or that looks like the feeder root system of a, a plant. Or if you've been trained medically, you might be thinking that looks a lot like the alveoli in our lungs where oxygen gets exchanged. My wife, Nancy is an herbalist. And one of the things that she's passed on to me is what's known as the doctrine of signatures. And in the doctrine of signatures, this old traditional way of looking at plants, people would say that leaf is shaped like the lung or some attribute of that plant suggests this use. And when I look at an arbuscule I, I, and think about feeder root system, tree, exchange of oxygen, I know that I'm looking at something really related to life on this planet, really important to life on this planet. And so I'm, I'm just, let's set the stage, recognizing that mycorrhizal fungi are really, really important. So we don't have time to go into all sorts of details about all these different things tonight, but let me just introduce the two major groups that are gonna have a role in our orchard. One are the ecto, E-C-T-O mycorrhizae, which are associated with the trees of the forest. So whether it's, it's hardwoods or conifers, uh, ectomycorrhizae are ones that we can see on the roots. They basically look like the root is fit into the sleeve of a glove. Um, they are ones that have fruiting bodies. So if you collect chanterelles or matsusaki or bolites, um, those are ectomycorrhizae fungi affiliated with certain specific trees. And, and the attribute I wanna point out about ectomycorrhizae is they have these explorer hyphae that can reach as far as 12 feet beyond the root. And I'm gonna come back to that, but that, that gives the fungi the ability to reach down to bedrock. Then the other fungi, the endomycorrhizae, E-N-D-O, 
Uh, they're the ones that actually penetrate into the root cell of the plant. And they have an affiliation with about 85% of the plants on this earth. And that includes the apple tree and the peach tree and the pawpaw and the persimmon and, and your berries and the clovers and the grasses and almost all the vegetables in your garden and the medicinal herbs and your flowers. So very important group. Um, unlike the ectomycorrhizae, which we can see, endomycorrhizae are invisible. And rather than reaching as far as 12 feet away, if my arm is the feeder root of an apple tree, endomycorrhizae, their hyphae extend maybe three to four inches beyond that root zone. So it, it, it gives the plant, the tree, a little bit more ability to reach nutrients than otherwise. Now, when you introduce endomycorrhizae, when plants have this affiliation, the fact that the mycelium, the hyphae outreach is in place, means that they're accessing maybe 10 to 100 times more soil volume than they would otherwise. When we look at a fruit tree and we see that trunk and that branch structure and the canopy and we know where the drip line is, the root of that tree extends a little bit further than the drip line. Um, but in truth, it only occupies about 3% of the soil volume where the tree is sitting. So the fungal connection is really important because it suddenly makes it possible to reach other zones in terms of accessing nutrients. And when we're dealing with a living plant community, there's all sorts of plant partners involved. There'll be all sorts of fungi involved and some of them will have different plant partners that suddenly connects different plants to this ability to share nutrients, to share water. So the, the fungi are, are involved because they're getting carbon energy from the plants, sugars, which the plants can produce by photosynthesis. And the plant, the tree in turn, is getting all sorts of mineral nutrients from the fungi in exchange for those carbon sugars. So it's a very mutualistic symbiotic relationship uh, and it just gets compounded and all the more beautiful, the more players are involved. So this is a picture of my orchard. Um, this was in spring, um, right after bloom. I've applied some kaolin clay, which has to do with repelling certain insects. And what you see here is, is not apple trees in straight rows. And I, I could plant them in straight rows, but it's a very complex plant community. And because I create that kind of ecosystem, I in turn have more diversity in terms of the biology that's working in the soil supporting my trees. And, and this is such an important aspect of growing healthy. Uh, you want that plant community, you want that diversity because that is where you're gonna get. All. So when I plant a tree, um, I've disturbed the soil. I know that some different species of mycorrhizae are going to be in place. But on the other hand, I also am going to want um, to be sure I have a good amount of diversity on the fungal scene to start with. And so I use commercial inoculum. Um, the ones I've listed here are the, the producers that have products that have nine different species of endomycorrhizae. And that's what I'd like to emphasize. If, if you're buying commercial inoculum for mycorrhizal fungi, the more different species you have, the better that product is going to be. And, and the relevance here is that in any healthy ecosystem, there are as many as 50 different species of mycorrhizal fungi at play. And endomycorrhizae, there's maybe only 400 species on the whole planet. And they are found in all the different ecosystems, the same players. And so the more we can have a touch of some of those guys involved, the more our trees are gonna get off to a good start. So one of the things I talk about um, again and again is this notion of fungal duff management, that that zone underneath our, our trees is where we wanna have not only that mycorrhizal aspect in place, but we wanna be feeding the fungal element. We really wanna be supporting that 10 to one fungal biomass advantage 
so that our trees in turn can be as healthy as they can because they're working with the fungal partners that they evolved uh, with from the very beginning. And part of that means having a little bit of an understanding of what are the right kinds of fungal foods. And one of the things that particularly rocks the humus casbah, so to speak, is providing soluble lignans. And the place that you get that is what's known as ramiel wood chips and of the tree. So two and a half inches in diameter and up, you have the buds and twigs and about seven. 75% of the nutrients in that material is going to be stored in the smaller portion of the tree. When you get into the larger stem of the tree, you have a lot more carbon. So the ideal form of food is chipped wood from the smaller portion of the tree, and ideally it is hardwood, deciduous type species. Those are the ones that are going to work with white rot fungi to build long-term fertility. So I, I talk about this in the book, talk about this in my presentations. I think a lot of you have heard this term, Ramiel wood chips. Um, but if not, you know, start to learn a little bit more about it because it's, it's the right kind of food to give your trees. And what's really nice for me, from my perspective, I have about three acres of orchard here on our farm. And we have a lot of alder and willow and, and other kinds of deciduous trees coming up along fence rows and on the edges of pastures. And every few years I go through and I cut that back and I chip it to bring that chipped wood into the orchard. It's small wood, it's ramiel wood chips. Another source of, of ramiel wood chips are the prunings. You know, don't burn your prunings. You wanna restore them, bring them to the soil so the biology can work with that to build long-term fertility. And, and by providing these fungal foods, you are essentially creating that fungal duff, which is the exact habitat fruit trees want. So this is a picture of the hyphae of endomycorrhizae. Um, the endotypes, we cannot see. We, we really access this through our imagination. Um, but once you tune into the important of what these fungi do with fruit trees, with orchards, really with all the kinds of plantings that many of us are involved with, um, and start to make it a priority. It's going to shift working with the soil. You know, the fungal kingdom has many different groupings. Uh, the sapotrophic fungi, these are the decomposers. Mycorrhizal fungi, we've just been talking about. The arboreal fungi, be it the yeast on the surface of the fruit when you ferment apple cider, um, it ferments because the yeasts already are in place. The epiphytic and the endophytic fungi, which are living within the plant, um, all of those groups have been neglected really in our agriculture because we focused instead on the last group, the parasitic and the pathogenic fungi, the ones that cause disease. And when we spray fungicides to deal with that, particular challenge of a disease of one sort or another, well, those fungicides kill the other fungi on the surface of the plant, they drip to the soil, it alters the perspective and we get deeper and deeper into trouble. Um, but once we start honoring the rest of the kingdom of the fungi, things shift. And one of the things I think is really cool, this, this is kind of sharing a, a future look here, is we're just beginning to understand mycorrhizal fungi, but living within the cambium cells of the plant, every plant has these endophytic fungi. And these are the ones that actually poke out through the cuticle of the leaf and on the surface of the fruit and bring nutrients in. And, and as, as we start to learn more about this as humans, um, we're going to start to understand what foliar feeding is really all about. I'm, I'm doing a lot of research in this area, and this really has me excited. Um, so anyway, just a little preview of, of what's coming. Let's talk a little bit more about mineralization. So here I'm talking about plant metabolism. And plants are out there in the sunshine. They photosynthesize. They go from there, create sugars. Those sugars, some are traded to the fungi. Some of those sugars combine with nitrogen to create proteins. 
fats, lipid compounds are created. And if metabolism is going along, really humming, plants go on from there to produce phytochemical compounds, which are basically the resistance metabolites, the terpenoids, the flavonoids, et cetera, that plants use to ward off disease and insects. Now, plant metabolism can be kind of humming at a low state, or it can be a lot more robust. And this is what photosynthesis efficiency is all about. And it turns out that if all the trace minerals, things like manganese, boron, iron, zinc, et cetera, are available to that plant, these trace minerals are used as enzyme cofactors, which help metabolism move along faster. So there's things we can do as growers to make sure that those trace minerals are available so that photosynthesis, rather than hanging in there at like 20, 25%, can be more like 30, 35, 40% because the trace minerals are there to make things happen. And this means larger leaves. It means more sugars being available to trade with the fungi. It means a tree is a built, has the ability to carry a, a greater crop load. It means a tree has a better ability to form flower buds for the next growing season. So that little bit of gain in photosynthesis efficiency really shifts the picture of what's gonna happen in terms of your fruiting prospects. It, it, this is all cool stuff. You know, we, in a sense, we're getting into the minds of plants. We're, we're, we're trying to understand as human beings, how do plants work? How, how does this green energy come to be? And, and how can we work with it most effectively so that we're creating a healthier orchard, healthier trees? There are certain points in the season when plants have all sorts of things going on. So just think about bloom time. Flowers are forming, flowers open, the bees come and pollinate, pollen tube grows, em embryo, um, the ovary cells are fertilized, a little fruitlet starts to grow, it's dividing its cells, it's forming seeds. All of that takes a lot of nutrients. And so there are certain points in the season um, at pink, at petal fall, uh, at first cover spray, where I include a tonic formulation of these different trace minerals. So AEA makes a product called Micropack. Agrodynamics in Pennsylvania has an excellent product called Micronite. Um, these are the sources of, of some of the trace minerals. There, there's other companies doing products as well, but this is one of those things that I add in my spray schedule specifically because I know at this point in the season, there is a high demand, many things are happening. I wanna make sure I just add that touch, a tonic touch of those trace minerals so they're available to the tree. Now, plants go on from creating those sugars to forming proteins. Proteins can be complete or the protein synthesis process may not be totally efficient, in which case there are more free-floating amino acids in the sap. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And the relevance of this, you know, we look at a plant, we're not, as humans, we're not thinking about any of this, but the relevance is big. And it is that when there is a lot of excess amino acids that have not been formed into complete proteins, well, that's exactly what foliar feeding pests feed off of. That's exactly what all the spotting fungal diseases, things like apple scab, feed off of. And if those amino acids are not in the sap, in the plant protoplasm, those diseases, those insects are not going to have the same food resource to get started. And so if we boost photosynthesis, we have those minerals in place, um, we're going to have, have more effective protein synthesis and the plant itself is just going to be healthier and have less challenges facing it because we're helping the plant do what it knows how to do. Plants go on from there to produce fatty compounds. So these will be the waxes in the cuticle on the surface of the leaf or when you spit on an apple, you can rub the skin and it'll shine. Well, that cuticle is a prime mechanism by which plants also resist disease. 
And that synthesis can be three to four times greater if photosynthesis is happening in a more efficient manner. It goes back to those minerals once again. This is also why you'll see my recommendations in the holistic spray, the core recipe. It includes things like neem oil and caranja oil and liquid fish because those fats are feeding the microbes. They're helping facilitate fat synthesis in the plant itself. Again, I told you getting into this, there's so much we could talk about. And so I'm, I'm just giving you an overview and hopefully it's triggering some thoughts and you're gonna look into it a little bit more. Another thing I do, and I love this because it kind of combines my passion for healthy agriculture with my wife Nancy's passion for the healing plants. And I use those healing plants in fermented plant extracts. I am using things like nettle and comfrey and horsetail and several other plants to extract the nutrients, the constituents in those healing herbs. So I can then in turn filter that plant extract and put that liquid in my spray tank to provide calcium and silica to the plant. And if you go to my website, um, groworganicapples.com, uh, there's a search engine at the bottom. If you type in there, fermented plant extracts, it will give you some links and you'll find an article that's posted in our library that gives you a recipe of, of what I'm actually doing here. Um, but this ability to, to take the resources of plants that grow on our farm, actually underneath our trees in some cases, and make a, a nutritional potion that's gonna help that tree be healthier and resist disease and grow better apples, better, better peaches, et cetera. Uh, I just, I love that. that. That's completing the circle. Other ways I get involved with minerals, um, kelp meal. We have sheep, we feed some kelp meal each evening to the sheep, dust it on some apples or different things at different points in the season. Um, and that, goes into their poop, which becomes part of our orchard compost pile. Um, when I plant a tree, I love to include two to four pounds of azomite clay in that planting hole in the soil immediately around where the tree is growing. Azomite is a uh, ocean deposit that purportedly contains all the minerals from A to Z, thus the name azomite. Um, in the spring, I spread gypsum. Um, about 60 days before bloom. In this case, I am looking to boost calcium levels, but also the other part of gypsum, gypsum is, is calcium sulfate, is the sulfate. And the sulfate helps protein synthesis. So nutrients have an, an important role to play and there's certain things that are really helpful in orcharding. Uh, another thing I like to use is um, rock dust, uh, primarily basalt and that has all sorts of trace minerals and nutrients as well. And, and there's different ways you can incorporate this. It might be through your compost pile. I actually use basalt as part of a foliar spray. Um, but as you start to learn, you'll see where's the right investment to make. What is food for the tree, food for the microbes that's gonna make me a more successful orchardist. And th these are just some of my primary examples of what I do. You know, it really comes down to the fact that we have to recognize that if we're to grow nutrient dense fruit loaded with all sorts of nutrients for us, which our body enjoys and uses to ward off degenerative disease, well, that really relates to the life density in the soil. The more fungi, the more different bacterial species, that plant community fostering that microbial community, that's where all this happens. And our job again is Captains of the soil food web, not to screw this up, health. So back in um, 1924, Rudolf Steiner gave a series of agricultural lectures, and he talked about um, all sorts of things that have become the basis of biodynamic farming. And one of the passages talks about how the roots of all these different plants will merge together and somehow produce a system bringing nutrients and fluids and saps throughout the plant community so everything is healthy.
empathy. And he called this the common root being. Earlier, I showed you a slide and I used the term common mycorrhizal network. In 1924, we didn't really have much of a sense of what was going on. People knew about mycorrhizal fungi. They'd given them that name, um, but we hadn't quite got beyond the idea that a microbe could be helpful. All microbes can be so helpful. But anyway, I like that term common root being. I'm bringing it up here because I want to keep you focused on the fact that another major way that these minerals are delivered to the plant is through that healthy soil biology, through that common root being. So it's not just us buying amendments. It's, it's us really working, fostering that soil biological connection. So tree immune function, here we are talking specifically about the phytochemistry of, of plant metabolism. And this phytochemistry is made all the stronger by the fact that plants experience some degree of environmental reality. And by this, I mean a little scab, a little rust. This will sound kind of almost like I'm being a blasphemer. <laughs> a little scab is good for the tree because it helps the tree produce a stronger response, which in turn means more nutrients in that fruit that are gonna be beneficial for us as well. If that tree grows in a cloud of fungicides and doesn't experience environmental reality, it doesn't do that to the same degree. Um, another part of this is how can we induce this phytochemical response? I'm gonna get into that in just a minute. And then another piece of the puzzle is that trees, that plants have enough reserve energy to utilize all these principles that I'm talking about. So right now, let, let's, let's jump right into it. We need to face our fungal fears. Our fear of microbes, and, and right now we're in a time when we certainly have a certain microbe, a certain virus in mind. Um, partly birthed by the fact that we really don't understand this, this realm and understand that diversity, immune function, have such a role in keeping things in balance. And so we've, we've fallen into this thing where apple scab, cedar apple rust, frog eye leaf spot, um, powdery mildew, pick your disease, your favorite disease, um, and we, we have this idea that we have to address it with a medicine. And in organics, those medicines might be copper, um, micronized sulfur, or lime sulfur. And I'm, I'm not going to get into the details of how those specific materials work. They might have a place in a really outrageous disease pressure year. Um, but I mostly don't use any of this. You know, I, I did spray copper in my one block this year um, because fire blight had got established. So I'm, I'm not saying we don't utilize these tools, but we don't think of that as our main approach. We understand that there's a deeper way, a way of working with the plants to deal with this. So some of these inducing elicitors, when we apply different microbes to the surface of the plant, different herbal remedies, um, terpenes found in things like neem oil, uh, compost tea, effective microbes, seaweed, uh, humic acid extracts, all of those materials induce this phytochemical response to resist disease. This is Jerry Brunetti. Uh, Jerry was a fabulous teacher. You might have heard him at an Acres conference. Uh, he founded the company AgroDynamics. And Jerry talked about how the key here is to activate multiple mechanisms with an assortment of foliar inducers. So when you read about my holistic core recipe, um, whether it's in the book or on the website, you'll see that I'm applying liquid fish, I'm applying seaweed, I'm applying effective microbes, I'm applying either neem oil or garanja oil or a combination of that. And, that, and that's just the core ingredients, but, but basically they're all inducing elicitors, bringing about that phytochemical response, which is gonna help the plant resist disease, help that plant not be as susceptible to insect pressures. And you know, what are the active ingredients? I love this, you know, it's not long chemical names, it's specific trace minerals, it's fatty acids, 
and its microbe diversity. So holistic timing. Um, on the Grow Organic Apples website, you'll find a tab for newsletters. And the June 2018 newsletter has the latest rendition of the holistic spray uh, protocols that I talk about. And I talk about the spring sprays, how that is where you prevent primary infection of things like apple scab. Comprehensive sprays are when we are dealing with almost everything. Insects come on the scene, little fruit is, are there. We are trying to foster the development of that fruit at the same time. We don't want cedar apple rust to get in there. We don't want frog eye leaf spot to get in there. We go into the summer and if it's a really wet summer and rots are an issue, um, that's what the summer sprays are gonna address. So you, re you really need to go to that newsletter to get a little bit bigger picture of, of what I'm talking about here. But the, the, the main point, the big takeaway here is that when we have that fungal duff ecosystem underneath our fruit trees, that fungal biomass is active and working, uh, we are gonna have trees able to take up nutrients in more complex forms. And that is going to mean that the tree, the plant, has more reserve energy to follow through on that metabolic pathway and actually produce the resistance metabolites needed. That's a very complex thought, but again, it's, it's, I want you to understand how we treat the soil, that fungal duff zone. This is where all these connections come about and produce things that make it possible to grow healthy fruit without the chemicals. Now, this, this is a green man that is on the wall of my post and bean barn. And when I feel like answering this question, he says, what do spots have to do with healthy apples? And I will explain to people that this scab spot here on, on this particular fruit um, grew on this tree with these 20 other fruit that you don't see any spotting, but it's because of that one spot that the tree went through this process and makes that apple that much more nutrient rich, that much more nutrient dense. Uh, and, and thus better for us. And, and that's again, referring back to that idea of environmental reality. So let's talk about the competitive colonization, the microbes on the surface of the plant, on the leaf and on the fruit. So not down in the soil, but up on the surface of the plant. And it turns out when that colonization is on the order of 70% or more, that is enough to deter pathogens from getting a foothold. Now that this is a huge thing, but the reality is that many things work against that arboreal colonization. So when I'm, when I'm talking about these microbes, I'm talking about bacteria and fungi, uh, those yeasts, all sorts of critters. And many of them are found in the soil. They've come up, they've risen. But when they're faced with weather conditions, be it high heat, drought, freezing cold, their numbers can dwindle. Ultraviolet light, radiation knocks them back as well. Our use of fungicides obviously would knock them back. Use of nitrate fertilization and PK fertilizers is going to knock those numbers back as well. And on top of that, there's only so much food on the leaf surface to support these populations. Well, when I come in, and include effective microbes in my holistic sprays. Um, this is things like phototrophic bacteria and particularly lactic acid bacteria and yeast. Those are numbers, those are microbes. They're gonna boost that number, that colonization level back to the order of 70%. This is a picture of a stomata. Uh, this is the respiratory, respiratory cell on the underside of the leaf where oxygen and gets exchanged. And one of the things about a stomata is it's an opening directly into the plant protoplasm. And there's a number of diseases and cedar apple rust in particular comes to mind where the rust spore lands on the underside of the leaf and actually sends its hyphae and gets its head start causing the disease by entering through the stomata. And when that stomata is going guarded by all sorts of different other organisms, both yeasts and bacteria, competing for that space, that shuts the door on disease. Um, a great example of this is with fire blight. 
So fire blight is a bacterial disease of apple and pear, and that bacterial disease uh, requires an opportunity. The prime opportunity is every time a blossom opens, it's a direct opening into the vascular system of the tree. Similarly, really tender shoot growth being whipped in the winds can become an opportunity for fire bite bacteria to get into the tree vascular system and cause that wilting, that browning, that shepherd's crook, which it's known for. Well, the answer to this is not antibiotics, but putting good microbes in place before the bad microbes take over. And so one of the things you read about in the holistic spray schedule is what I call a competitive colonization boost. And here it's basically um, a little bit of coranger oil to provide those fats and also to act as a spreader, effective microbes, a higher rate than I normally use, a little bit of seaweed. And another thing I've started using is sea crop, which is sea minerals, a condensed seawater product, um, because I've heard really positive things from Western Northwestern growers who are using that for fire blight. And this is what I spray during bloom if fire blight conditions threaten. So that means temperatures are in the 70s, even approaching 80, and it's very humid. That means fire blight is really gonna take off. I wanna be sure that my blossoms have competitive colonization in place to prevent that opportunistic bacteria from causing the disease. And the thing is, it works. <laughs> Rather than using antibiotics um, or some of the other failed strategies that have come out of IPM orcharding, um, I am utilizing the microbes themselves to protect their niche. It seems so simple, but for humans to get their head around this has been more of a struggle than I would expect. Um, but this is what I do for fire blood. Doesn't mean that I'll have to cut out some fire blight strikes, but it, this is what makes the difference because I'm understanding there's a partnership involved helping plants protect themselves from disease. Another thing, just to briefly mention, um, you know, people will talk about cankers and all sorts of afflictions of the bark. Well, biodynamic agriculture, uh, one of the ideas from there is what's called biodynamic tree paste. And at its very simplest, this is a slurry mixture of native clay and biodynamic growers will say fresh cow manure, but that could be compost, it could be earth. So the clay acts as, as kind of a healing salve, but the microbes in the compost or in the manure, they're the competitors. They're the ones who are gonna claim that niche or reclaim the niche of disease, something like black rot canker is already in place. So slathering that on the bark, on the lower branches of the trees uh, can make a huge difference in tree health over the years. So hold on to that. If you're not familiar with the idea, look it up and understand that we do have things we can do to alter the prospects for a tree for the better. Finally, that brings us to outrageous diversity. You know, in part, <laughs> All those different plants plugging into that common mycorrhizal network, um, that's gonna mean more biology, more things bringing nutrients to the tree. But we're also talking about a lot of different tap-rooted plants. Even something as simple, simple as the common dandelion. Um, dandelion is known as a potassium accumulator and its taproot brings potassium up to the surface. It goes into the leaf, into the stalk. And when those parts of the plant decay and break down on the surface, Potassium is now available for the next growing season for the fruit tree, for the berry bushes. Comfrey is another plant I use a lot, which has a big top root system, both deep and broad, and it accumulates calcium and other different nutrients. So diversity from the perspective of increasing fertility, that's one thing. Here's a picture under one of my fruit trees. Um, doesn't look like an herbicide strip. You see comfrey, that's a broader leaf plant. Uh, there's some valerian in the front. The ramia wood chips have been a little thicker in the middle and the shade of the tree prevents grasses from really getting thick in there. Um, this is the kind of plant community I'm talking about underneath these fruit trees. Another great source of many things in an orchard ecosystem 
are plants like alder and willow, things that could be coppice. So when I coppice that particular plant, uh, I am getting ramio wood, which I might chip, or I might use the whole cutting of the plant and bury it as a form of mini hugo culture. Again, I, I know I'm throwing many terms and some of you don't know these terms, but I'm, I'm basically using a wood resource. But here's the coolest thing of all. These trees, what are called soft hardwoods, things like willow, alder, popple. And, and the other night when there was a talk on agroforestry from the perspective of, of orcharding, creating a polycorch culture in the orchard, different plantings. When you have these types of trees, the soft hardwoods, they have a relationship with the ectomycorrhizae, the ones that have those 12 foot explorer hyphae that can reach bedrock, but they also have a relationship ship with the endomycorrhizae, which fruit trees, berries, grasses, all the other plants are associated with. And so it's in these, the protoplasm of these particular trees where two different fungal systems merge and they can get the nutrients from the bedrock from the ectotype fungi and it can go and be shared to other plants through the endotype mycorrhizae. That, that's a huge concept, <laughs> this notion of bridge trees. But when you have these types of plants within a couple hundred feet, willows, alder, popple, of, of your fruit trees, you are complexing the mycorrhizal community many times over because we're now able to call on nutrients from bedrock, which we could spend more time on this because it's, it's really cool. But anyway, bridge trees, polyculture, agroforestry, it's good stuff. In terms of incorporating diversity, you know, this look to nature. Um, things grow in clumps. Um, think about flowers blooming throughout the season to support the pollinators. Um, a mixture of native grasses out there is important. Um, but again, it's just the more diversity, the better. Now, one of the things that insect allies need, so things like ladybugs, lacewings, is they need food resources as adults. Um, that nectar, that pollen is gonna be used to support their lives, but that in turn means that they're in place to lay their eggs and it's their larva that are often the beneficial insect uh, stage of, of that in insect's life in terms of pest control. Let me tell you about macrocentris. So there is, um, Quite a lot of us probably deal with oriental fruit moth. Uh, some of you probably deal with peach twig borer. So these are both moth pests of fruit trees. And there is a bracken, braconid wasp, which is a parasite of these two species that can parasitize as much as 90% of their numbers in late summer to provide long-term control of that pest. And macrocentris, going back a slide, what does macrocentris need? What does this baconid wasp need in order for us to get high enough numbers to reach that 90% level of control? And, and, and understand when I say that, I'm not talking about spraying an insecticide. I'm talking about letting nature take care of the situation. Well, it turns out that macrocentris numbers will increase if there is a diversity of plants specifically um, something like strawberries growing in the orchard ecosystem or in the vicinity because there is a strawberry leaf roller, which will be an early food resource for these baconid wasps uh, in spring. And from there, it'll go on to get the oriental fruit moth and the peach twig borer. And then on the other end of the season, if we're growing sunflowers in the vicinity of the fruit trees or Ella campaign or any members of the sunflower family, those plants will draw the sunflower leaf roller, a different pest, and not relevant to the fruit tree, but it becomes a food resource for macrocentris late into the fall. And then if we can get over our notions that we have to clean up nature in the fall and let those sunflower stalks in place, that's where macrocentris lives. So we have greater numbers to control the pest that's giving us an issue on our peach trees. Um, and it, it's all a result of diversity. Rudolf Steiner, again, 
Everything in nature is interdependent, everything. You know, I, I think you're getting a sense of that from this talk tonight. It's, it's all these strands, but they're all part of the puzzle. They're all part of the tapestry of what makes it possible for us to grow beautiful, healthy fruit for our families, for our community. Um, some of you know Eliza, Eliza Greenman, <laughs> and she coined the phrase, um, eat ugly apples. And, and the point was, you know, what's one spot of scab? What's a little sooty blotch that you can spit on and rub off uh, when the fruit itself is going to be that much tastier? We're, we're very fussy with where we've gone with demanding of what our fruit looks like. Uh, all of us in NAFEX, because we're directly involved in growing fruit, have the advantage of, of knowing what the challenges are, knowing that it's, it's not easy uh, and appreciating what we do, do get. And, and when we grow something like these are the Bethel apple, um, an heirloom from Vermont of the blue permane family. Um, when we grow apples, the way I've been talking, uh, we're growing healthy apples. And those healthy apples are gonna help us be healthy in turn. And here's a Bethel in my hand. It's that time of year, I can hold the Bethel right now. Um, this is what we're about. You know, it, it's fun to explore the different varieties, figure out what we can grow in different climatic zones, but ultimately it's about growing great fruit that we enjoy, teaching others um, this can be done, we can work with nature. Um, and I hope that some of what I've had to share has launched you in, in things that you need to think about. And let's go to some questions and, and see what we can do from there. Fantastic, thank you, Michael. That's a wonderful talk. Um, I hope this has inspired a lot of people. We have several questions. So we'll start, we're gonna go, I think some of this you may have answered, but I think it would be good to go to reiterate some of, some of these points. So um, someone asks, do the ecto and endo mycorrhizal fungi compete with each other or do they complement each other? That was early on. So I, you've, you've answered this, but I think it would be good to hit home on that again. So the, the ectotypes are affiliated with the, the trees of the forest, the hardwoods and the softwoods, the conifers. And there are thousands of those species. And a tree may have 12, 20 different fungal partners at the same time. And, and mostly the ecto realm does not share the space of the endo realm. So all the other plants have the endomycorrhizae, but it's only in those bridge trees and in, in, in the alder, the popple, the willer, pawpaws, et cetera, where you get that combination of the fungal systems. But it, I'm glad you asked this question because <laughs> this was not a fungal talk, but there's so much cooperative fruit tree. It, it's not competitive. It's, it's about, which fungi has the right skill set at the right time. And, and it's really about an ebb and flow and, and fungal partners will come and go. And in, 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 in leaving, they leave behind carbon in the soil. That's how carbon gets sequestered in the soil. Um, but, but there's a rotation to this. And this side of the tree may have this fungal partner or this side may have that. Um, and the, when I said there's as many as 50 different fungal species in a healthy ecosystem, that's very suggestive of the fact that it, it's not so much me and no one else. It's about partnership. It's about teamwork. Good point. So we have another uh, member, Steve, who's asking, is there a resource where they can find, um, find out where ecto and endo mycorrhizae are affiliated with specific trees? So, you know, is there, I guess, a good oh, place to go? So, so one of the places, Steve, that you could go is um, mycorrhizal applications, and, and they will have a list of different fungi found on different tree species. But, but even here, um, there's, a, there's a lot of shared mutualism, <laughs> and, and there will be one ectotype that'll have an affiliation with a hardwood and also a conifer. Um, so it, it's, it's much broader than we know, and, and another thing to it, understand about the fungal kingdom is as we humans it's it's probably a bold assertion to say we know about 10 percent of this earth. 
but but yes, we know some of those affiliations. You can find certain things talked about in research papers, but mycorrhizal applications also has a, a list that will get you some indications. Great. And then Joseph Postman asked, and again, I think this has been answered, but um, do endomycorrhizae have to be added at the time of planting or can they be introduced on an established tree? Well, hi, Joe. <laughs> I talked with you a long time ago when I was learning about what I needed to say about pears. Um, when we plant a bare root tree, we have this great opportunity to get the fungal spores very close to the root. So it, it turns out that a spore needs to be about three sixteenths of an inch away from the root to get the germination signal to form this union. So getting things close is important. On the other hand, um, endomycorrhizal spores, the inoculum product, can also be applied two, three, four years down the road, move aside an inch or two of the fungal duff, put maybe a teaspoon or a tablespoon, depending on how big or a radius you're putting, a little goes a long way. Restore the fungal duff, the rain or irrigate is gonna move those spores down into among the roots, they'll germinate and take off. So yes, it, it can be done after the fact. We don't have to dig up our trees and inoculum, inoculate them directly on the root, but the bare root moment is a great moment to take advantage of. RS asks, do you have any success stories to share about intentionally growing edible mushrooms that are mycorrhizae in orchards? That's it. It's a good question. So one of the things to understand is the mycorrhizal fruiting bodies that are mushrooms that we can eat are affiliated with hardwood and conifer trees. Um, and, and for some reason, fruit trees, as far as we know, do not have that relationship. So other than an actively decaying old apple orchard, where the, um, now I'm blanking out, <laughs> the, the one type of mycorrhizal fungi will take off. Um, they're not gonna have that relationship with fruit trees. Uh, it, it's gonna, be sapotrophic types. So I have tried to create fungal beds of things like chestnut mushrooms and popple mushrooms out in my orchard, feeding off of ramio wood chips and decaying logs. But it, it's a it's not mycorrhizal. Bob Baines asks, can you speak to the transmission of canker disease when using uh, ramio wood chips? Okay. Um, So it is true that when we're pruning it in the orchard, I tend to want to pull that out of the orchard. If I see black rot on an older tree, um, I might pull it out of the orchard and burn it. But I also know that problems on our fruit trees are aerial diseases. They, they have their realm in the zone above the soil line. And when I make wood chips or I bury woody debris to some form of localized hugo culture, I am basically putting them in a soil environment and that changes it. So the transmission of an aerial canker disease from a wood source isn't gonna happen when we get it into the soil environment. That's a quick answer, but it, it's really the basic def the, where the things change. The reason that it's not the concern you might think it would be. Bob also asks, does it matter if the, the Romeo wood chips are fresh or up to six months old? So if, if Romeo wood chips from a deciduous source are fresh, you have that soluble lignin factor in a bigger sense. So that can help jumpstart a fungal ecosystem. On the other hand, this organic matter has a lot of value. Um, I actually cut down, thinned a section of, of along the fence line this week, and I chipped it deliberately to spray it over the orchard compost pile that I built up 
with my cider pumice and sheet muck and other Ramio wood chips from earlier on. And I'm, I'm not applying them out in the orchard fresh. They're gonna be there as kind of a cover on this compost pile and eventually mixed into the compost. But I'm gonna get all the value of that organic matter of the 75% minerals that are in the finer part of the tree. And it's gonna serve as a fungal food six months later. You know, similarly, <clears throat> I've, I've talked about how ideal Ramio wood chips are deciduous species, but I also use conifer species. But I know that I'm going to age conifer wood chips because it's gonna take six, nine, even 12 months for those wood chips to be broken down by what are called the brown rots. And the brown rots are not really amenable to deciduous species. So our fruit trees are deciduous species. But if I age those soft wood chips, I, I use them as animal bedding, I use them on garden paths, I use them in the blueberries, it's, not, it's a different kind of plant. Um, I can get that organic matter, but I get beyond the brown rot phase which me and brown rot, not like on stone fruit, it's a different brown rot. Um, I get beyond the allopathic aspect of that and those wood chips become valuable. I, I often use soft wood chips in, in my uh, orchard compost operations as well. So it all has a place, but there's a little nuance to understanding how best to use it. Do you, along those lines, do you worry at all? I've, I've heard debates about this, especially people who are getting wood chips um, brought to them about things like black walnut and sort of the, the negative potential effects of black walnut on apple trees. Are you worried about those types of wood chips at all? So yes, if, if you primarily have access to black walnut, black walnut produces juglin and that's a kind of an allopathic chemical phytochemical that the walnut uses to protect its nits. Similarly, cedar has a lot of those resinous oils or eucalyptus and, and things like that just need to be really aged if that's the resource that you have to use. Otherwise, just be real wary and not, never apply those things fresh. Eric asks, do you need to worry about over applying the micronutrients? I think so, Eric. Um, we can overdo it. So we have soil testing, which gives us some, some indication, but that's not always the accurate information we need. So things like iron, manganese um, get oxidized by the bio, uh, biology that's in the soil, and that's not useful for the plant. Um, I've spent the last three years working with plant sap analysis. So I, I do this at at Pink and again at Petal Fall and then again at Terminal Bud Set in early August. And I'm, I'm getting a sense of where are nutrient levels in the plant itself. And it, it partly informs what I'm doing with foliar nutrient sprays. But yes, we can certainly overdo it. Think of copper. Um, and copper, let's say that that's been your go-to for a fungicide to deal with black rot or to deal with fire blight. And years and years of copper applications have gone in. You're going to have high copper levels in your soil and that's going to be toxic to your earthworm so so yes it can be overdone when i talked about the the micro pack and and, and micronite um, the tonic formulations well i'm emphasizing that word tonic because they're minute amounts but it's enough to get that flow going for the plant um but yeah we we, we can easily overdo it um so we we have to be aware that balance balance is an important word in all this all right, David Fulton asks, or comments first, interesting comments about leaf fungi and photosynthesis efficiency and the importance of feeding the leaves. He says it sounds familiar to some of the work from John Kempf on the plant health pyramid in particular. Are you broadly in agreement with John's model or are there things that the two of you would perhaps disagree on? No, I've, I've learned many things from John, and I, I'm very appreciative of, of the things that he's introducing and teaching. Um, and I've worked with AEA. I do my plant sap analysis through the lab that they use in the Netherlands. Um, I think that sometimes the recommendations 
that come from the company that makes the products are a bit much, a bit expensive. And I'm, I'm learning how to make some of those formulations. I did, I have learned, and John would probably debate me on this, um, that iron and manganese, when I apply them at the same time, contradict each other. And I spent a whole season and made no progress getting iron where it needed to be. But last year, when I separated those applications with every other holistic, I have both manganese and iron on target. So it's, it's an involved discussion, but uh, I totally appreciate the teachings of John Kempf and much to be learned there. And yes, I am, I'm certainly weaving that into the orchard story that I'm telling. Great. Uh, somebody with the name Swissberry uh, says she heard that he or she or they, I heard that neem oil is affecting the bee population. Any thoughts on that? So neem oil, which comes from the azadiractor tree, contains um, azadiractins. And these are compounds that um, inhibit the molting cycle of insects. And basically that whole progression from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And so, so neem is useful against foliar pests and has some deterrent aspects for things like Japanese beetle, because they, they sense this inhib inhibition of the molting cycle. And similarly, if we were to get lots of neem into that honeybee hive where the bumblebees took it back to where they're developing their pupil, uh, that would be an issue. But I do not spray neem during bloom. Now, some neem is going to go on wildflowers underneath the tree. There's this um, that aspect, but I have not found it to be an issue. But when I gave that competitive colonization boost and I talked about using Karanja oil instead of neem during bloom, that's precisely because I want to be conscious of not applying azadiractins where bees are going to pick up an excess amount. Okay, great. Uh, Bob Baines asks, do you have any experience managing voles? So voles, um, you know, on young trees, you really can't get away from a tree guard. That's important. I will also add that, um, you know, I, I spent this afternoon mowing in the orchard because I want to reduce vole cover. I don't want a whole lot of high grasses where they can hide. Um, they particularly like those clumps of comfrey. So I was, I was cleaning all that up. Another thing I will do is... Most of my pruning gets done on the other end of winter, but I'm gonna do some early pruning and I'm gonna throw some branches here and there as a alternative browse so that when the snow comes, the voles that are out there have something to eat. But mostly I'm hoping that uh, between hawks and foxes and coyotes and pine martens, mm -hmm. a lot of those voles got to get taken care of. But on my young trees, I definitely have a tree guard. Once a tree gets to be, oh, I don't know, five, six plus inches, I find that the mowing and the alternative browse tends to be enough. Um, but yeah, you have to be conscious of voles and, and don't make the mistake of planting trees and thinking, I'm gonna get those vole guards next year because they're often the ones that are gonna get eaten that year. And you know, it's we all know that, but we all seem to go through that life lesson of, yep, I better do it right next time. Yep. See, David asks or says, I wanted to use the biodynamic bark salve salve on suffering on a suffering American chestnut. Wondering if there's been any experience with that. Yeah, so the the, the chestnut tree was actually the teacher. Um, as, as, as you know, David and others, probably chestnut blight when it came into Central Park back in the late 1800s, um, then went on to decimate throughout the Appalachian, oops, <laughs> the Appalachian area and uh, mature chestnuts died. And, and they would die down to the soil line, but then that disease was stopped because it met the North American soil food web. 
And so some organism in the soil or a combination of organisms outcompeted the chestnut blight fungi. And, and so today people have actually been crossbreeding back American chestnut with Chinese chestnut to get in that resistance. And in the earlier generations, they recognized that when a bark lesion got in there before a nut, a viable nut was produced, the answer was to reach down, take some earth and rub it into the bark lesion where the disease was getting a foothold and that would stop it because it was introducing the American, North American soil food web up there in the tree. So my answer is that the chestnut tree itself has provided us that answer that through whether it's the biodynamic remedy or just plain old earth. I've actually been finding, and, and, and I don't deal with a lot of black knot on plums, but I have one European plum and it was getting lots of bad black knot. I pruned it out religiously and then I'd see fresh lesions starting. And then I thought, I'm gonna deal with this with the microbes. And I was cutting off the knot as it was starting to form and just taking earth. I wasn't even getting into mixing the clay and, and doing the whole biodynamic approach, just taking earth and that black knot lesion stopped. Now I have only one year and I almost shouldn't be saying this because I like to have a few years before I start sharing information. But I was just like, this is amazing. I, I, I really want to stress this. There are bark issues um, and it doesn't matter that it's apple or chestnut. Getting those good microbes in there is what changes the dynamics of the, the disease issue. Great. Uh, let's see, Gloria Bell at, says, she has a question about willow. She said she used willow mulch leaves specifically on some potted apple seedlings and they all died. The ones that she didn't mulch survived. Um, she said she had about 50 and 50 total. And uh, in her experience, nothing is growing under her willow, not even grass. And she would love to mulch with willow, but has concerns. Yeah, that seems like a good lesson, Gloria. I, I don't know about willow leaves and, and the potted environment for those trees, but obviously you learned something of relevance. Um, there's, a, there's a new book out by Ben Raskin, the Woodchip Handbook. He's in Britain. And he talks about some research where they're using willow chips, Ramio willow wood, um, and putting that underneath the apple trees and that the salicylic acid content of the willow chips goes into the tree, which helps it ward off apple scab disease. And, and that makes sense, but how does one chip enough willow <laughs> to always do that every year? Um, I know some people who all just simply soak willow twigs to get that salicylic acid aspect to put in a spray to induce salicylic acid production in the tree itself, which is one of the immune pathways that's fighting off apple scab. But what you experienced, that, that's new to me and I, and I have not heard that. And that's, uh, I mean, obviously it happens. So that's something to be aware about in terms of excess willow organic matter in a potted tree environment. And okay. next question, this is a really uh, thought provoking question. And, and I'll just lead into this as a biologist saying that I know this is a huge concern in the vertebrate and invertebrate uh, world, but um, are you aware of any damage to the soil food web done by nanomaterials? So nanoparticles, nano... Little plastic particles. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I am not versed in that. I know that that's something that we are contam contaminating our planet's many ecosystems with. Um, and I, I should learn more, and, and, but I don't know more. That would, that would be a great article for someone to delve into in Pomona. Um, I'd like to read that article. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know in the vertebrate and invertebrate world, it's just now really starting to, to be studied. And I don't know if there's much in the plant world, but I think, I think we'll be seeing a lot more work on that area. Let's see, Lori, uh, uh, let's see, Lori Bracken. In the competitive colonization boost recipe, it calls for activated microbes. How do you obtain this? And are there other names for it in searching, when searching for it? Or is it possible to cultivate it as a brew? 
So when you buy mother culture of effective microorganisms from a company like Terraganics or SCD Probiotics, uh, you're getting this mix of lactobacilli and yeast and acidomycetes and phototrophic bacteria. Now, Korean natural farming will we'll talk about ways that you can culture lactobacilli through the soil, through a rice culture. Um, certainly dairy products are gonna contain lactobacilli and yeast. I am, so I buy the mother culture, I use that part, but I've also been experimenting successfully, taking the lees from a carboy of hard cider and, and I use the term effective cider microbes for this. And I, I like the whole, you know, closing the loop, um, doing this on the home front. Those leaves contain lactobacilli and the very yeast that came out of my orchard to ferment the apple juice to begin with. And when I feed them with blackstrap molasses, I can go through that whole same pH drop. So when I use that word activated, I'm talking about feeding mother culture to produce more organisms in a greater amount of liquid so that I'm keeping this more economical. So you can use the mother culture directly from the, the manufacturers, um, but, but I'm actually feeding it with blackstrap molasses and, and the, the basic kind of proportion is there are three quarters of a cup of mother culture, the gallon of water. Um, and if you took a gallon of mother culture, you could get 22 times the volume in terms of pro, um, activated microbes that you can spray. So that's what that word activated means. I am I'm simply making really economical use of the ability of microbes to reproduce themselves. Great. Uh, Mark uh, Wolbers asks, are lichens a good companion on the surface of a fruit tree? I like that question, Mark. <laughs> you know, often it's, it's like the human perspective. The human eye says, oh, that must be competing. Well, that's the point we have to like say, no, wait, no, wait, we, we're going to look at this more collaboratively. What lichens are doing is um, they're not parasites. They are taking advantage of that aerial environment on the bark, but they are in turn creating habitat for other beneficial microbes that might have a lot of value in that arboreal food web I'm talking about. So I have no problem with lichens. You know, I, a tree that's in decline and in the shade and really needs a lot of pruning, that might have a lot of lichens because it's, we've created a habitat that's just too lichen friendly. <laughs> but if you're properly pruning and, and there's good airflow and lichens are growing, I, I'm fine with that. I, I know that that's just more habitat for, what I want to work with in terms of growing fruit. Great. Uh, locally here in Indiana, the guys at Sober Mesa, Robert and Juan Carlos ask, can you share the lab you use for the sap analysis? So the, the, there's a few different labs doing this. Um, and when you go through advanced eco-agriculture, John Kemp's company in Ohio, it will be sent to the Netherlands, um, and that's the one I've been using. Uh, Texas Plant and Soil Labs does a plant sap analysis. Apical out in Oregon does one, but I, I've been working with AEA A advisors as part of my learning path, and also I've developed a relationship with a guy in the Netherlands and got some more lessons as well. Um, so there are different ways. It is, there is an expense to this. You know, it's typically gonna cost you like 75 to $90 a test. Um, so not every home orchardist is gonna do this. I'm, I'm trying to kind of understand it in a deeper way so that in the, admittedly a next book, I, I can go into, if you're not actually doing plant sap analysis, here's some good bets of things to work with. Um, but I am learning a lot. Um, and I, like I said in the talk, I'm doing it three times a year. So I, I, I get a sense of what I'm referring to as nutrient pulsing, that there's certain nutrients I need to do in the front end of the season to stoke the capacity of the plant to take in that nutrient. Um, and, and yes, that's the lab I'm using, Crop Health Labs. That's what it's, I forget, that's John's 
lab in Ohio or the one in Novacrop, that's the one in the Netherlands. Let's see, Chris Homanix asks, any insights for people dealing with spotted lanternfly? You know, that's becoming a big thing here in the Midwest, a little concern. Well, I could glibly tell you to move north. That would be <laughs> one answer. Um, no, I, I have not dealt with that. I'm aware of that. I actually grew up in that part of Pennsylvania. Um, but I have not dealt with that directly. So I, I am not the guy to, to address that one yet. You know, I, I would like to think neem oil might be part of the a useful solution there, but I don't know enough, Chris. So I'm not going to guide, guide you in the wrong direction. Okay. And Adam Bingham asks, what kind of poop besides sheep are used in this kind of system? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you right now that my orchard compost pile this year has a lot of bear poop in it because... <laughs> <laughs> Bear has been eating the drops. Uh, cow manure is fine. Um, I I like the manure aspect, particularly with bedding, with hay, with wood chips, to go with cider pumice because that otherwise gets pretty slimy. Um, I use some chicken manure. Most of that goes into my garden compost piles. But no, having that aspect to animal diversity <laughs> to make your compost can be a really wonderful thing. And I don't, I don't think we're necessarily limited, you know, horse, that's maybe the more challenging one, but that that's more a function of that usually comes with a lot of sawdust bedding and that's high in carbon. And, and so we don't have balance to begin with there, but sheep and cow are really good. Great. All right. I know there's a few more questions. Let's see. I'll do one. Um, one more here. Argentinian ants are invading us in San Diego, California. Help. They harm the leaves and the roots and have no predators here. Well, again, I'm going to say to move north. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know about Argentinian ants. Okay. So I'm not going to be the guy to go for there, but I'm going to look that up because that, that makes me curious. Okay. All right, just to be respectful of everyone's time, um, including Michael's, um, I think we'll stop the questions there. I wanna thank you, Michael. That's been a fantastic talk. Um, I know that uh, a lot of people were enlightened and probably a lot of new terms for some people. I highly encourage you all to check out his books because there's so much there and you can spend the time reading through and learning some of the term terminology. Um, again, Michael, give us your website so people can go there. So it's groworganicapples.com. Okay. Um, this has been real fun. Um, live conferences are nice because we see each other and, you know, the computer never laughs at my jokes. So I don't know how they <laughs> go over. But uh, I, it's really exciting to, to be talking to what I know is my family. Um, mm -hmm. This has been a fun night. So thank you all. All right. So before we leave, um, just a, a quick note to all of you. So this was our last uh, session, but everything's been recorded. You can access all of this tomorrow. Please check your email tomorrow, tomorrow morning sometime. We're going to send out a survey along with links to all of the content. Not only are the sessions recorded, but all of the speakers have provided a ton of content, whether it be their PowerPoint slides or supplemental material. So you'll have, you know, forever to look through these things and, and kind of glean information out of that. Um, with the survey, what we really need from you is to know how you felt about this conference. Um, last year, we did a mini Zoom conference in the midst of the pandemic, um, and that sort of was the inspiration for doing this much bigger one. Um, I think as a board, we feel this has been successful, but we want to hear from you. We want to know what you liked about it, what um, topics you want to hear about next year. And we're also probably going to do the Zoom interest group meetings again um, here in the early 2022. We played around with that last earlier this year, it seemed to be a success, but we really want to kind of dive into some specific topics and keep people engaged, especially in the winter months. Um, while we're kind of sitting at home, you know, doing sort of the, the things that we're dreaming of for spring. So give us that feedback. What do you want to hear about? Who do you want to hear from? Um, and just, you know, let us, you guide us. We're here for you as a board. And then also consider getting involved, whether you want to be a board member, you want to be involved in the interest groups. 
um, or if you just want to, we, we're thinking about an advisory board for the different regions or maybe the regional help. So lots of ways to get involved, but you know, NAFEX is us, all of us, not just the board. So we want everyone to guide us and to give input and help us grow forward in the years to come. Um, and I'll just reiterate, um, we went into this not knowing what to expect, the board did. And I can tell you, since we launched this in early October, we have acquired over 280 new members um, alone just for this conference. Um, on top of our existing membership. So there's clearly this desire for people to grow fruit and to explore fruit and to learn more. And so we really appreciate you all helping us spread the word to get that out there. So thank you again to all of our participants, all of our speakers, Michael for being the great keynote speaker. And you guys have a fantastic weekend and uh, start dreaming about what you're gonna grow next year. And if you have any questions or concerns or insights, just email us at admin at nafexmembers.org. So cheers to all of you. Have a great evening. Thank you very much and grow forward. Mm -hmm.